Good morning, all. Um, my name is Rob McClellan. I'm the division head here in uh, cardiology. It's my pleasure this morning to uh, introduce Dr. Vigancy. First, I would uh, like to acknowledge that this is one of our named lectures every um, uh, year, and it is sponsored by uh, Joan and Werner Sampson. <laughs> Uh, um, um, as you know, uh, Werner is our most experienced cardiologist um, in the division and has sponsored, he and Jonah sponsored this lecture for a number of years now. And it's really important, you know, um, as we go on um, and our opportunities to bring in people from the outside and visit with us and so we can learn from them sort of become restricted that uh, these types of electorships really uh, are a great opportunity. We want to thank uh, Joan and Werner for that. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Clyde Gancy. He is currently the Chief of Cardiology at Northwestern University and the Associate Director of the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute there. Um, Clyde probably doesn't know this, but I actually became aware of him very early in my career um, when I was a fellow at Baylor, but it was the other Baylor down in Houston, and he was the director for heart failure and heart transplant up at Baylor um, in Dallas. And so um, I have sort of watched his ascension through the ranks since then. He has far too many accolades for me to go into, but I'm just going to sort of like uh, jump from mountaintop to mountaintop. He was recently the president of uh, one of our largest professional societies, the American Heart Association. Um, he um, is an outstanding teacher and won the AHA's Lenec Clinician Teaching um, Award. Um, he has a long um, and very productive uh, career in clinical uh, research, particularly with respect to heart failure, hypertension, and cardiac prevention. And for all of this, he was recognized and elected into the National Academy of Medicine um, a year and a half ago. Um, and so I'm particularly happy that I'd accept our invitation and look very, uh, forward to this talk this morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. In a city where coffee is such a staple, I would have thought everyone would have been wide awake. So I'll say this again, good morning. Yeah, that's much better. I am truly delighted to be here. I've already had a chance to connect with friends that I know here at the University of Washington, had a lovely evening with fellows. I started some faculty visits yesterday and I really am very much appreciative of the invitation and admire the esprit de corps that's here at, at as you affectionately call this institution, you doubt. I'll try to work on that over the next day and a half so I can say that correctly. Um, I too want to extend thanks to Dr. Sampson as someone who supports and produces these kinds of programs in Chicago I recognize the importance of the philanthropic gift. So your contribution to medical education is warmly and especially appreciated. The task that I want to share before you is to deliver grand rounds. And you can see the title about which I hope to speak that's on the screen before you. But I went to medical school in 1978 at Tulane in New Orleans. And Tulane then and now still represents a traditional medical school, although some innovations have really started to take place. I recall the first grand rounds that I attended as a medical student at Tulane. They were actually in the amphitheater of the Charity Hospital in New Orleans. I recall a patient coming in the room and a history being developed with the patient in the room, an examination being performed tactfully by an experienced senior physician and as such, that was the method by which I was exposed to Grand Rounds. If you look further into Grand Rounds, you find this definition. I won't read the definition to you, but I'll remind you that Grand Rounds originally began as a very patient-oriented exercise that uniquely was focused on the education of physicians and training. As we go forward, though, there have been statements in the literature that really do challenge what it is we do and why. 
the nomenclature is can we make grand rounds grand again? Because there is a phenomenon called the graying of grand rounds. Patients are no longer in the room. It's become this kind of format. You can see some of the comments here that reflect the history, started by William Osler in the late 19th century, typically at the bedside, then moving to an amphitheater. You can see in quotations, well-organized, decorous, stately, punctual exercise. You can think about a free discussion between thinking men and women of widely different interests and experience. But the questions have become, it is expensive, and what's the evidence that this actually improves education? And so in this same publication in the Journal of Medical Education, there are a couple of objectives that we should try to hit. Provide an update in diagnosis and treatment. Provide updates in medical research. Promote collegiality among faculty. Provide continuing medical education credit and importantly, educate residents and faculty. And in large measure, this relates to our current understanding of adult learning theory which really says that the exercise we go through of generating objectives, doing a survey, understanding what it is that the audience needs to know becomes very important. So I'll call your attention to a very recent publication. The Journal of the American College of Cardiology published just within the last several weeks. The lead author is a fellow. This is a part of the ACC's FIT program of fellows in training. And he is now um, a newly hired faculty member for me at Northwestern. But Akil really, wanted to articulate where we are right now in the arc of learning as cardiovascular physicians. You can see that the beginning of the arc starts with conferences, which is where we are today. And that's presumably how we first are introduced to our medical nomenclature and theory. But as time goes on, it becomes more personalized and we are challenged to bring in other kinds of learning strategies to really round things up. So in keeping with the tradition of grand rounds, let's start with a patient. This is a patient I saw just last month, January 22nd. It's a 55-year-old African-American woman. She's a college professor in the Chicago area, teaches organic chemistry. De facto, she's smart. <laughs> Risk factors include black race, obesity, hypertension. And beginning in mid-November, she had the onset of dyspnea, which really was interpreted as flu or flu-like illnesses. And she went through three different providers with the same history until one provider slowed down long enough to take a picture of her chest, identify cardiomegaly, and then take a picture of her heart, i.e. an echocardiogram, and an ejection fraction of 15 to 20% returned. At that point in time, the primary care physician was challenged with trying to find whom it is in the community that could provide the kind of sophisticated oversight and how best to make that happen. That is, there was a challenge in just the mechanics of a referral. I'll speak about that later. And this was the initial treatment strategy. Spironolactone, 25 milligrams once a day. Metoprolol succinate, 100 milligrams once a day. Evabradine, five milligrams once a day. No RAS inhibitor because of concerns about an ACE allergy. So not only not an ACE inhibitor, but not an ARB. But phase two cardiac rehab was initiated. No referral for an ICD and no patient education. And so one has to raise the question, is this consistent with optimal or ideal care for a patient with heart failure? In the context of speaking to an audience populated by internists and those training in internal medicine, this really does become an important question because it says, potentially this is the community standard. And my intent over the next 20 minutes or so is to make you aware of a different standard. So this is what we want to do, is talk about the care of heart failure in 2018. And there's several points that I hope to make and at the end, I'll try to emphasize that these are the points that we did make. The first is the prevention of heart failure with a focus on hypertension. The second is the culmination of several years now of intense review of the literature that has been orchestrated or archived as clinical practice guidelines addressing heart failure. And the third is the new tool that we've created, directed and shared with the audience. 
I'm being prompted to purchase something, which I will not do. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me that Amazon has made it to Grand Rounds. <laughs> no, not that we know of. But I will share with you a tool that we've since developed that is intended to facilitate the implementation of the guidelines. And for those of you that are involved in this, it really is our first real foray into implementation science. And then for the 15 minutes that remains, what I'd like to do is to convince you that what I'm sharing with you is not a completed sentence, that there are a number of outstanding questions that we still need to address. So let's begin. Any statement about heart failure, particularly one that originates from my position, starts with this template. This is the overview of how the guidelines are constructed. At the top, you can identify two large categories, one being at risk for heart failure on the right, on your, on your left, my right. And in the left, you see two categories for symptomatic heart failure. These are further deconstructed into four stages. They are intuitive, A, B, C, D, A being those simply at risk, B being those with asymptomatic alpha dysfunction, C being those with symptoms ever, and D being those with persistent symptoms. The second tier shows the prototypical patients and the lower tier shows the evidence-based therapy. So this is the template against which we understand how best to assess heart failure. When we first derived those stages, and I was part of the group that did such, we were resolutely criticized for overnight deciding that many, many more people had heart failure than ever before much like the authors of the hypertension guideline have been criticized for overnight deciding that many, many more people are hypertensive than before. But it's all predicated on either evidence or clinical judgment. But what's remarkable is that these data validated the orchestration. And this begins to introduce what I'm going to share with you today, one of several pause moments. This is when I want your absolute attention because I'd like to make a very important point. If you look at the natural history over 10 years of patients either without any risk factors, risk factors only, or asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction, their survival out to nearly 10 years approximates having no risk factors at all and no disease. But with the occurrence of any symptom of heart failure, and particularly with the recurrence of persistent symptoms C2 and refractory symptoms, CD, you can see how dramatically different the survival characteristics are. It would stand to reason that we should work very diligently to keep our patients in the red box in the earlier categories. That is to say, prevention should be our key consideration. I've had a number of running discussions with Mark Pfeffer at the Brigham about this very notion, my perspective coming from heart failure with reduced ejection fraction his coming from heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but we've arrived at the same place. We should really do everything we can to prevent our patients from entering this heart failure club because it has such adverse consequences on their prognosis, so we should think that this club is not a favorable place for our patients. So there was a time when we could just have this conversation and talk about the importance of it and be passionate. But now we can do more than just have the conversation. We can actually think about meaningful ways for this to happen. And the most important and clinically actionable way right now is focusing on hypertension. Look at these data. If this room is populated with 100 attendees, 20 of you will develop heart failure, period. That's the expectation from the best epidemiology we have. 20 of you will develop heart failure. I see a couple of people looking left and right, hoping it's not me, it's not you. But particularly if you're hypertensive, that number goes up to about 33 of you. If you are an older woman, that number gets close to 40. So the point is that hypertension calibrates this risk of heart failure so exquisitely that it really represents an appropriate target for intervention. I'm sharing with you now the outcomes data from the SPRINT trial, I had the privilege of being on the data safety monitoring board for this study from the beginning, 
and part of the voice that terminated it early based on evidence of profound benefit. But what strikes me is the arrow that highlights that one of the most important outcomes that drove the primary endpoint was a reduction in the onset of hospitalized heart failure, a 38% relative risk reduction in the likelihood of developing heart failure. This is prospective, randomized data that really makes a strong statement that in those that increase cardiovascular risk, treating the hypertension to a threshold not previously orchestrated and outlined by guideline would result in improvement. We have since published this analysis in one of the auxiliary chapters and auxiliary books of Brunwald's textbook on heart disease. This in particular is a book on hypertension and we wrote the chapter on the prevention of heart failure. And if you look at the amalgamation of 20 years of hypertension clinical trials, the arrow shows you the consistency of the ability to reduce the likelihood of developing heart failure. So that now has been fully endorsed and it should be incorporated in a guideline statement. Moreover, work that we've done at Northwestern by virtue of access to something called the Lifetime Risk Pooling Project, meaning that at our site, we are able to bring together the Cardia data set, the Framingham data set, the Mesa data, data set, and the Chicago health data set. So we have four data sets that cover over 100,000 well phenotype patients with their longitudinal follow-up. These are phenomenal data from my standpoint. There are four plots here. The two upper plots are separated as a function of gender or sex. The two lower plots are separated as a function of race. Here's the setup. Can you hear me if I step away from the microphone? So in the red line, you see no risk factors for heart failure. And if you look at the natural history from age 45 out to 80, if you track on that red line, the likelihood is very low that you will develop heart failure. The black line, on the other hand, shows all three risk factors being present. If you track with that cohort from the age of 45, within 13 years, you're likely to develop heart failure. That is especially so in the black patient. Now, what are those risk factors? Obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. You begin to get the message that I'm trying to convey, that it is possible, more than possible, plausible, to prevent heart failure, but to do so, we have to focus on risk, where the best data reside is in the treatment of hypertension. This is the new schema associated with the treatment of hypertension and outlined and highlighted in the new hypertension guidelines. It's not my intention to go over this, but it is my intention to make certain that everyone is aware that we have this new approach to treating hypertension ostensibly so that we can optimize the evidence that says that we can change the natural history of cardiovascular disease with unique emphasis on heart failure by following out this new treatment algorithm that begins with a risk assessment and then identifies in whom it is that we should proceed forward with the treatment of hypertension according to new lower targets. And I'm happy to develop that in the Q&A. So finally, that gets us to this point. We took it upon our responsibility as a heart filler guideline writing committee to endorse these findings by including in the update published in 2017, this particular statement. This is a class recommendation one, tantamount to this is something we should do. Level of evidence is B, randomized trial. And it says in patients at increased risk, that is stage A heart failure, the optimal blood pressure in those with hypertension should be less than 130 over 80. And if you go on to the subtext in our guideline, it is for the express purpose of reducing the incidence of heart failure. If there is nothing else you take from this morning's conversation, if you walk away with this idea that it is potentially possible to prevent a significant number of cases of heart failure by focusing on the treatment of hypertension according to this statement, this will have been an accomplishment. We have further articulated this in a patient-friendly graphic that we published in JAMA Cardiology within the last several months, again, to support the notion 
that it is important to emphasize the treatment of hypertension and it includes the non-pharmacologic treatment of hypertension, that is lifestyle changes. And so this too is another step forward. So let's go beyond the prevention, which is the first thing I wanted to share with you and go to the second thing, guidelines. This is the committee with whom I had the pleasure of putting together the heart filler guidelines. And we've got three publications out of this group. There is one from 2017, one from 2016, both of those are updates. And then the core publication was 2013, which was the complete guideline statement. It's all predicated on this updated image of the progression of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. This has been a benchmark for all of us to think about heart failure for easily 25 years. We believe that there's an index event, either acute like an MI or myocarditis or chronic like hypertension, that over time leads to enlargement of the ventricle, a change in its straight, its shape, something we call remodeling. And we believe that that is catalyzed by an increase in RAS activation, an increase in adrenergic activity, and a suite of other neurohormonal responses. The more contemporary assessment shows us that there are additional mechanisms that are at play. Changes in metabolism, changes in contractility, changes in gene expression, some that are upregulated, some that are downregulated, programmed cell death, that is apoptosis, microcirculatory defects, oxidative stress. This is the way in which we understand reduced ejection fraction, heart failure, and this is what we're trying to treat. There are at least two systems, physiologic systems, that really matter most when we think about treating heart failure. This is a depiction of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's not necessary to go through an exhaustive review here, but it is important to emphasize that with the elaboration of angiotensin II and its interface with the angiotensin II type 1 receptor, a suite of adverse biological responses occurs that lead to remodeling and fibrosis, that leads to oxidative stress, that leads to sodium reabsorption, that leads to norepinephrine release. It is our intention by using RAS inhibition to thwart or interrupt this process. This process is in juxtapose with a more recent awareness of the biology of the natriuretic peptide system. There isn't a clinically active person in this room that is unaware of BNP as a biomarker. Some of us dread it because it ends up being a new vital sign. But if you get away from that perspective and think about the biology of natriuretic peptides, something very different occurs. The natriuretic peptides that are elaborated as a function of in ventricular diastolic stress, right or left, actually interface with their family of receptors, natriuretic peptide receptor A, B, and C. Those receptors de facto represent guanocyclase enzymes. Those enzymes are responsible for the generation of cyclic GNP, which in turn leads to protein kinase G and all the biological activities that happen with the elaboration of protein kinase G are the antithesis of those that happen with the elaboration of angiotensin II. So that's led us to these data. Brilliant data. I have no relationships with the study or the sponsor. So I think I can qualify my statement by saying these are brilliant data that demonstrate that over and above what we had respected as sacrosanct, the benefit of ACE inhibitors in the treatment of heart failure, the taken approach that inhibits the RAS system and upregulates the natriuretic peptide system is superior. This finding was so important that it drove the necessity to rearticulate the guidelines and acknowledge that there is a better way, but that better way is limited. And this is where I take great exception to the marketing. This is not for every patient with reduced ejection fraction heart failure. It's predominantly been tested in those with mild to moderate disease and only in those with a sufficient blood pressure to tolerate the hypotensive effects of the therapy. So we should be very measured in our embrace of this new technology and realize that it's not for every patient. We also should be aware that additional other new physiology has come to our attention. If I were to look at the resident physicians, you know, many Grand Rounds halls, the residents all sit like in one cluster. It's almost like to try to avoid, to deflect the incoming missiles, you know, their strength in numbers. 
so I get the sense that maybe they're over here up to the right. <laughs> All right. So if I were to speak to one of the residents and say, how is it that beta blockers work in heart failure? You would probably give me a very elaborate answer and say, well, they inhibit the sympathetic nervous system and they reverse the adverse influence of norepinephrine. And I would tell you that you're just wrong. That is what we've been espousing for some time, but we have very little evidence to say that's the case. In fact, it may very well be that it's all about myocardial energetics and slowing heart rate. And what we discovered now is that there's another way to slow heart rate on top of beta blockers. And it's by targeting this F channel. This IF channel appears to exist uniquely in the SA node and only other places in the retina. When this channel is inhibited, it impedes diastolic repolarization, which leads to a slower heart rate. And the clinical trial would suggest that on top of beta blockers, this actually improves at least morbidity, maybe heart failure mortality for the heart failure physicians in the room, but not total mortality. But at least it's another value add. It is important, though, that it be given with the beta blocker, which is the way it was done in the clinical trial. So that left us with yet another reason why we had to recapitulate the guidelines. So the first thing we had to do was to say, how should you use this new compound, the combination of a neprilysin inhibitor and a RAS inhibitor, otherwise known as an ARNI? So based on the evidence, we said, in patients with symptomatic reduced ejection fraction heart failure, class two or three only, not one or four, who tolerate an ACE inhibitor or ARB, defined by having an adequate blood pressure, no angioedema, replacement by an ARNI is recommended to further reduce morbidity and mortality. That is not an equivocal statement. That now is a truism, and that is a way in which we should go, but all of the caveats need to be respected. But if you're going to write a guideline about a new therapy and show how it should be used, you need to also state how it shouldn't be used. And so we, in fact, did that. The red is evident, harm. If you give this compound concomitant with an ACE inhibitor, you increase the likelihood of angioedema, particularly in those that are of African descent. When this approach was tried before with an ACE and an epilysin inhibitor, fatal episodes of angioedema occurred. The drug was no longer developed. In fact, if you give this compound to any patient with a history of angioedema ever, we believe that's contraindicated. So this is how you shouldn't do it. The previous graphic is how you should do it. And this is a statement, a comparative statement for the use of the evabridine. A little bit less veracity with regards to the recommendation, but nevertheless, based on data. So that gets us to an exercise that I've been through several times now. I have the privilege of working with a number of interesting and incredibly bright people across the country, one of whom is Greg Fonero. We've gone through three thought experiments of what would be the potential benefit if all therapies indicated for heart failure were given to the right person at the right time for the right reasons. And about 18 months ago, we published this analysis where we really went to the predicate studies for each intervention and tried to identify the number needed to treat. For everyone in the room, what I will share with you is that when the number needed to treat, this is for all cause mortality, is double digits or lower, you can rest assured that this is a profound influence. Now, the natural history is averse, but it does make the argument that the treatment of heart failure with contemporary interventions does in fact change the natural history. So for anyone whose education was that there's very little you can do for heart failure, that needs to be completely recalibrated. These data would argue significantly against that. I will also say, for the first time now, we have randomized controlled data that palliative care actually works. We've always assumed it, but now with this PAL-HF study done by the investigators at Duke, there's very clear evidence that a structured palliative care intervention improves functional capacity and improves quality of life and we should not dismiss this information. So here is the second big pause moment. The first pause moment was the arguments about prevention. This is the second pause moment. This is the depiction of the contemporary treatment of reduced ejection fraction heart failure. Take a picture, which it took four practitioners to do in the case I presented. Identify the low EF with symptomatic heart failure. It's obligatory to start the RAS inhibitor in an evidence-based beta blocker. And then there are six scenarios. These six scenarios prompt other therapies and they're not mutually exclusive. And so this allows us to develop 
a tailored or personalized approach for the patient with reduced DF heart failure, and only if they have refractory symptoms do we go further. But the question becomes, is that easy? How many internists would feel comfortable that for all the different therapies available for heart failure, you could see a patient with heart failure right now and orchestrate a perfect medical regimen? So what we did in response to that question is to sit down and develop something very pragmatic. And this is called the expert consensus pathway. We just published this information last month. Well, let me explain the process. We gathered together 60 parties with skin in the game, if you will. And we prompted, and this was a live meeting, we prompted each to go back to their constituencies and say, rather than have those of us that write these kinds of documents say, we think this is how we can make it easier, go to your constituencies and tell us what they would want to have answered. And so this was a ground up process, if you will, not a top down. And then we took that input and then orchestrated, in ten, orchestrated it into 10 principles that reflected what the field survey, if you will, a kind of simplistic way of crowdsourcing said, these are the things that challenge us in the care of patients with heart failure. What are they? Well, there are two under initiating therapy and or converting patients to newer therapies. There are several that reflect overt challenges. What about making the referral like the case I described where there was so much difficulty doing that? Care coordination, adherence, specific patient cohorts, the older patient, the woman, the African-American patient. How do you deal with the high cost of care? And then how do you manage the complexity, the comorbidities, and what about palliation? This is what the community wanted us to address. So this document has 10 domains, and each of these domains uniquely addresses these areas. I'll just give you an example. I won't, again, completely dive into the detail, but we took the figure I showed you before with the scenarios and tried to make it even more explicit. You can see the prompts, titrate, add, switch, add, add again. The color scheme follows the guidelines, the scenarios are in boxes, but then we further deconstructed that and we have prompts for each of these therapies and we wrote this so that it is compatible with digital formats, tablets and smartphones. So the practitioner seeing these patients can access this information relatively easy. We also emphasize that diuretics are not as simple as we thought. There is a phenomenal review from Mike Felker and the New England Journal of Medicine that really highlights the physiology or rather the pathophysiology behind diuretic resistance. Understand that there's renal tubular remodeling, particularly with the chronic exposure to loop diuretics. And so we have to know this biology in order to use the diuretics in an expert way. We also dealt with the therapy with which I have the most alignment in terms of discovery and promulgating that is hydralazine and isobutyl nitrate. Here is the information for the RNA compound, aldosterone antagonist, and evabridine. What we try to do is to make it so that for wherever the question is, we have an algorithm, a do's and don't, a tip sheet specifically for that. I'm just going to show you an example of one response to the 10 issues that really came from the community for which we were supposed to address. And this one was really an interesting response. How do you actually do all of this? So it starts with the initial assessment, the serial evaluation, the intensification of therapy, and then the prompts for reassessing the patient. But we were particularly pleased with answering the question, what about when the patient doesn't respond? What does that mean? And so there's this acronym that we were able to develop and leverage with others, and it's simply, I need help. It may seem a little chintzy, but if you deconstruct it, what you come up with is IV anotropes, NYHA class, in organ dysfunction, ejection fraction, ICD shocks, hospitalizations, edema, low blood pressure, and inability to take medicines known to change the prognosis. This is very easy to think about in the clinic and really constitutes a nice prompt for when one should refer. So that's where we are for heart failure care in 2018. But what I want to do with the last 10 minutes now 
is to talk to you about why I think this is still a work in progress. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk to you about biomarker confusion. There are three points I want to make here. The first one is straightforward. The neprilysin inhibitor, Secubitril, within the combination of the neprilysin inhibitor and the RAS inhibitor disrupts an enzyme that has many different substrates. Oddly enough, one substrate for the enzyme is BNP. One substrate that is not impacted by the enzyme is NT pro BNP. So when you give this compound, regardless of how the patient does, the BNP will rise, as you see here, this is initiation of the RNA compound. Look at the line in red, the BNP goes up. So if you are practicing clinical heart failure medicine, and for whatever reason, looking at the biomarker, be aware of whether or not the patient's on the RNA compound. That's the first point about biomarker confusion, if you will. Here's the second point. Getting away from the way in which it's used in emergency rooms. What about the longitudinal assessment of the biomarker? I think these are fascinating data. These data come from the same large trial, and they demonstrate what happens when a patient enrolled in the trial started with a very high NT pro BNP and either dropped that NT pro BNP to less than 1,000 or failed to lower that BNP, NT pro BNP to less than 1,000. You can see that for those patients that achieved a nadir in the NT pro BNP less than 1,000, their outcomes were substantially better. Now, here's why this is so important it is irrespective of treatment assignment, regardless of being on the RNA compound or being on an ACE inhibitor based regimen. This is why I think it's so important to get some clear space between the marketing and the reality. You can treat your patient very well with an ACE inhibitor based regimen. And you can rest assured that if your patient on an ACE inhibitor based regimen has this kind of response, their outcome will approximate the same outcome they would have had on the RNA compound. So this is one way in which the biomarker can really help you. If that's true, then some of you, the cardiologists are aware of this, but some of you might say, well, why don't we just use this as a treatment barometer as we're introducing therapy and following patients? And in fact, for 15 years, we've tried to guide therapy using biomarker assessment. And we had signals that were pro, con, or neutral, but the definitive study was done, NHLBI sponsored, called Guided, and these are the results. No matter where you're seated in the room, you'd say, well, so much for that approach, because it's no better than the control population. But here is where it's different. Look at these data. This looks at the change in NT pro BNP in that guided study. So whether the care was guided by the biomarker or guided by an experienced heart failure physician at the bedside, looking at these patients, you know what? The NT pro and B fell by the same magnitude that I just shared with you that corresponds with an improvement in outcomes. So this wasn't as much a negative trial it really was an example of superior clinical medicine in the control arm. Now, if you really want to get provocative, these data were just published in Jack. This is a large European registry that involves about 60 countries, 25,000 patients, and there are three arms here. This is addressing the question of, is it important to get every patient on threshold doses of, in this case, ACE inhibitors and MRAs? What they were able to demonstrate is the following. If the patient couldn't get to at least 50% of the recommended dose, that's scenario C in gray or black, they did least well. But what's interesting is if the patient had a response in biomarkers, it was a panel of 161 biomarkers. Some stuff was as simple as weight, some was as sophisticated as FGF23. But regardless, 161 biomarkers, if there was a response, regardless of the dose, the patients fared well, arguing that not everyone needs full dose, but you need a dose that impacts some surrogate of ventricular remodeling. And for those patients that did get to greater than 50%, their outcomes were terrific. And so it really does give you another nuance about biomarkers. What does an ejection fraction mean? I come from a world where we thought once upon a time about systolic dysfunction and diastolic dysfunction, 
And then we started describing heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction. That demarcation is completely arbitrary. There is no science whatsoever behind that demarcation. It just reflects how we aggregated the data, how we collected the data. Because in fact, it's a continuum. This is a paper done by one of my junior faculty members with Doug Mann, published in the European Heart Journal about three months ago. And it shows the interrelatedness of these assessments and the convenience grouping of reduced EF, preserved EF, and now this new phenomenon, mid-range ejection fraction. These data, I think, are really profound. This comes from a group of Framingham investigators. Connie Shaw is the first author here. This is about 10,000 patients, followed out for nearly 30 years, all of whom were asymptomatic, all of whom had periodic measurement of ventricular function. This paper was in Jack Imaging, by the way. So they were able to demonstrate that in these asymptomatic patients, as a function of the EF, you could see what the time to heart failure death happened to be. And now if you do spine modeling and generate a smooth line, it's almost a linear function, so much so that for every five unit change in ejection fraction, there's a 23% increase in the likelihood of developing heart failure or death. So I would argue that we should reframe the way we approach ejection fraction and not think of it as normal, but think of it as a continuous life variable that has implications all along the way. The Europeans have tried to specifically articulate guidelines for mid-range ejection fraction. This is still a work in progress. In 2013, we tried to introduce the concept. You can see B especially, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but it was improved greater than 40% in that mid-range category. But what's interesting is that now we have data in part generated by one of your fellows when he was at Emory. These data look uniquely at the group of patients in whom the measurement of the ejection fraction, yes, thank you for, for your, your, your support there. <laughs> He's getting a lot of attaboys from everyone sitting around him like, he mentioned your name. <laughs> but specifically, these data identify the group of patients, about 15% in the cohort, who previously had a low ejection fraction that improved into this 40 to 50 range. What did, what did we find out about them? Well, look at their mortality com compared to those with reduced EF, preserved EF, and in mid-range, substantially different. And if you look at the curves, you see what you might expect to see, but it's hard to see, so I deconstructed the curves. Here is cumulative mortality, gray is recovered ejection fraction, and here is the event rate death for heart failure hospitalization. The early observations are always very robust and very illustrative, but they also require a lot more calibration before we can incorporate it. I'm less passionate about the category of mid-range or improved EF but I'm more passionate about what does this mean? It means that somewhere in the heart failure cascade, there are patients who have the ability to recover their ejection fraction either spontaneously or with exposure to evidence-based therapy. And so we editorialized when this was published and had a list of things that we thought were reasonable explanations for why this might happen, but worthy of exploration. But I'm happy to see this published in JAG Translational Science this is introducing a new concept in cardiovascular medicine. It's called metabolic epidemiology. For many years, those of us that deal with outcome sciences have used ordinary descriptions, age, race, weight, renal function, gender, to try to understand who's at risk and who isn't. But look at where the field is going. Think about the myocardium, getting tissue. Think about the microbiome, the gut, providing information. Think about all of the metabolomic and proteomic measurements we can get from the serum, and think about the genomics we can get. So our ability to better identify, better orchestrate the disease is so much better than ever before, and it's actually happening for this group with recovered ejection fraction. This is the announcement of a brand new study group from the NHLBI. We have representation of that study group by virtue of one of our faculty members. It's going to be led by the University of Utah, Stivros Dak. De Dacros, Dracos, and they will in fact use the core from LVADs and use that as a repository of tissue that will help us get into this 
if you will, metabolic epidemiology to really understand what's happening, who's getting this disease, and hopefully reveal new targets. How many electrophysiologists are in the, order, in the audience? They probably knew not to come because of what I'm about to say. <laughs> so for years, we have prompted at a very high order the necessity to place an ICD as primary prevention for persons at risk. I was one of the original investigators with Scud Hef, and Wayne Livy has done an incredible job trying to better risk adjust so we know who gets benefit from ICDs and who doesn't. I love these data that were published just about eight months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is from a group of European mostly investigators, but they took 20 years of heart failure trials. Pay attention to the open circles. The open circles show the control arm in those 20 studies. The control arm being the group managed by study coordinators according to what was then considered the prevailing best practices. There is a linear almost decrement in the annual rate of sudden death, arguing, arguing that the incidence of this condition is falling, likely because of the benefit of evidence-based medical therapies. And then we have the Danish study, which looked in patients without an ischemic etiology trying to prospectively determine if there is still a demonstrable benefit of the IC and overall survival. There are a lot of warts and bruises in this study, but I will show you the curves demonstrating no benefit on death from any cause, no benefit from cardiovascular death, and a slight benefit on sudden cardiac death. Do we have the courage to revisit this prompt for ICD therapy in patients with heart failure particularly without ischemic disease. I think the natural history is changing courtesy of the evidence-based therapies. And then finally, this is really hard to do. It's easy for me to do it because I think it and live it and breathe it and I go to clinic several times a month and I do service six or eight weeks a year. So it's easy for me, it's my language. But if you don't do that, this is really hard to do. What about the requirement to use high-dose ACE inhibitors? Remember that all that information came in an era when we didn't have beta blockers and MRAs. This meta-analysis done by the UCLA group would say that there may be a modest benefit on all-cause mortality, or cardiovascular mortality, but not great. I interpret that to mean that we can probably use a more modest dose of the ACE, and that really isn't the direction we go. I have the privilege of serving as chair of the American Heart Association's Get With the Guideline Heart Failure Subcommittee, We've got 1.3 million records and we generate about 12 to 15 papers a year out of that data set. One of the more provocative papers was this one. In 50,000 patients in hospitals that were focused on quality improvement, only half the time were we doing the right thing for the right patient at the right time. This is engaged centers. The other half of the time between one and five opportunities to improve care existed. So it tells you that even when we're working hard, we still miss the opportunities and my study group published these data just two months ago, demonstrating that real world data, whatever that means, would suggest that despite our discoveries, our breakthroughs, there is no difference in outcome for heart failure with reduced EF, preserved EF, a mid-range EF. Doesn't mean our evidence is wrong, it means our process needs to be improved. And so this is still a work in progress. You would think our process is getting better. This is the introduction of the RNA compound. If you look at the expanded axis scale, it looks like there's an inflection point. But pay attention to the actual data. You see that through 2015, 2016, very little evidence of an uptake. It should not be used as robustly as the marketing would suggest, but it should be used much more than it's being used. So another challenge. So what about the path forward? I go back to here. To finish up with just two quick concepts. All these arrows go one direction from left to right. It's a subtle thing, but it was intentional because we have no evidence that you can go the other way. Or maybe we do. These are brilliant data from Dan Linehan, who was at Vanderbilt, it's now is in Missouri. But based on what we understand about what happens when trastuzumab is given for the purposes of treating cancer and working through the regular pathways, We've identified that if we can restore the ability for endogenous repair, it might make a difference in cardiac function. And so there is a cogener of neuregulin that's been developed 
And in a dose ranging study, small study, but randomized, this is what we identified. A single dose at one of the two higher doses led to a substantial improvement in ejection fraction, 10 ejection fraction units that was sustained at least out over 90 days. This is a radically different approach to treating heart failure. It may be uniquely important in those that have been exposed to chemotherapy, but it gives us promise that there may be a way to actually reverse the phenotype. So how do we need to go forward? This collaboratory recently published their proceedings and suggested the following. This is our dilemma. Patients are at the center, but look at everyone that touches a generation of evidence. And think about all the different agenda items that are operative when you think of all the people that are touching the patient. No wonder we have a difficult time getting to a set of data points that we can actualize because there's so many parties at play. So I want to finish with a summary. Heart failure, I think, has a number of works in progress that we have to consider. The use of biomarkers remains unrefined. Ejection fraction should be the gold standard. We need to understand how best to interpret it. Deeper phenotyping may help. The ICD use is something we need to revisit. And adherence and in turn optimal outcomes remain a challenge. But reversal of the reduced DF phenotype may actually be possible. I believe that what we tried to emphasize today is the following, that there are many new effective therapies for heart failure that are orchestrated along, I think, carefully constructed treatment algorithms with tools to help with implementation. There is increasing complexity in the treatment of HEFREF. This will require more careful assessment, but so be it, because I think patients, given the outcomes they face, need to have that kind of care. There is new information important new information that I think should drive the prevention of heart failure. And avoiding entry into the heart failure club is the best therapeutic approach. I was in Texas for many years and ran three heart transplant programs while I was there. Um, for any of us to do any kind of structured medicine like heart transplantation or dialysis or work in interventional labs or EP labs, you know the following. The person who taught you the most about what you do is a nurse. This was the nurse that taught me the most about transplant medicine who recently died. And she gave this to me, and I still have it on my desk. It's a Chinese proverb, and she generated it in calligraphy. A mediocre physician treats advanced disease, a good physician treats disease, and a great physician prevents disease. And her point was, as much as we work to treat people with advanced disease, we should continue to work hard to prevent disease, and I agree with that. How many of you have uh, seen Hamilton? So Chicago is a great city. I mean, the Emerald City is cool, <laughs> but Chicago is really a great city. And we have Broadway in Chicago. I've been twice, I have two daughters and I'm taking each daughter separately. And there's one part of, the, of Hamilton that I love. It's the room where it happens. You know that, that scene, the room where it happens? Does somebody know that? It's fun, isn't it, isn't it great? So this is the room where it happens at Northwestern. This is everybody that's got a hand in heart failure. Great group of people to work with. Dan, I know you know half of them at least. <laughs> so this is, the, this is how we spend our time. I'm delighted to be here. I have time for questions and I'd be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you.